Welcome to the Next Cloud Podcast. Let's talk about digital sovereignty. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of the Next Cloud Podcast. My name is Marius Quabeck. I'm a video producer for the Nextcloud marketing team, so I manage audio and video productions here at Nextcloud. Beginning with this episode, we've decided to take the podcast back in-house, but I would like to say a huge thank you to Ingo Abel, who has been hosting this podcast since its first episode. I've got big shoes to fill. The format of this show is going to stay mostly the same, though. It will still be interview-based, where I talk to interesting partners, developers, and other people from the community. We are aiming for 12 episodes per year, so one episode every month. Also, beginning with this episode, we're going to have chapter markers from now on. That means if you're listening to this from a podcast app, um, if your podcast app supports it, obviously, or if you're watching this on YouTube or listening to it from the website, there will be a section somewhere where you can select different topics and time codes to listen to those specifically. To bring this podcast back, I've decided to sit down with Nextcloud founder and CEO Frank Kalicek to talk about what has been happening in Nextcloud in 2022 and our big plans for 2023. Hope you enjoy. Hey, Frank, thanks for joining us. Happy 2023. I guess we can still say that even though we are recording this in the midst of January. <laughs> How has the new year been treating you so far? First of all, thanks a lot for having me. I'm really happy to be on this podcast again. Um, how is the year treating me? I don't know. I mean, I had a nice sort of vacation over the holidays, so it's over. So in, in, from that regard, it's not so, it's not so good <laughs> to be back at work. <laughs> You're back at the cold and rainy Berlin, as I can see. Yeah, exactly. No, but that's, I'm just joking. Everything is good. Everything is fine. So, yeah. Great. Yeah, we're, we're so stoked to have you on the show again because um, since we're relaunching the podcast, it's, it's great. And we, and we thought we could maybe do a bit of catching up with what has happened in 2022 with Nextcloud and a bit of an outlook, what we're planning with Nextcloud in the in the upcoming year. And we wanted to start by um, the, the first major thing that happened um, in 2022 was that Nextcloud um, joined the Open Forum Europe um, for an open and competitive digital ecosystem. So, this, so it's as we titled it back then. Do you remember that? Can you still say something about that? Yeah, it is. It is interesting. I mean, it's so the Open Forum Europe is um, like a it's like a lobbying organization on the European level, and of course everybody, including me, when they hear lobby organization, they think, "Oh, this is bad. Uh, who likes lobbying?" But uh, <laughs> they are actually lobbying for open source and open standards and other things like that. And um, yeah, I know them for a long, long time, uh, ten years, I think. I don't know. Um, I'm also like a fellow of uh, of this organization for a while which means i sometimes give talks and sometimes invited to talk with politicians on the european level to convince them to do good decisions and not bad decisions <laughs> which sometimes work sometimes not right um yeah and um yeah we just this next lot decided to support uh, their work a little bit more so we have an official supporting member um uh, paying them some money so they can fight for yeah more open source under under European Commission level. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely important. And we will we will circle back to that specific topic uh, over the course of this podcast when if I'm looking at the list right now. So um <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely come back to that. Another thing we did in 2022 was uh, we did in collaboration with the European Commission a hackathon uh, titled the Next Cloud Hackathon, where we invited like people and teams from all over the world to contribute to Nextcloud and to improve the the Nextcloud ecosystem. And we we had a huge success with that. We had over 60 participants from 33 different countries, and um, uh, a bunch of um, of the submissions we got from there is, is uh, were actually been upstreamed in in Nextcloud. Um, I think the winner of the second prize which was a team from malaysia spain and greece um, they contributed the uh, org chart feature for our contacts app which we just mm -hmm. debuted in next.hub3 yeah how, how do you feel about these like um, european sponsored hackathons or hackathons in general frank <laughs> this was one of those moments where um, i really i don't know I have to uh, remind myself uh, how how popular Nextcloud uh, um, is nowadays uh, because I mean I, I started all of it like many many years ago and I still have this mindset this is yeah this is just a few friends doing some open source hacking together uh, and then 
yeah, and then big stuff like that happens that actually the European Commission uh, approached us uh, and said, hey, um, what you're doing is cool and can we support this somehow and can we do this hackathon and sponsor it and advertise it and so on. And then, I don't know, I'm sometimes, uh, I don't know, baffled or <laughs> really surprised that uh, big organizations like the European Commission think that, um, yeah, putting something into next cloud is a good investment which are obviously this right public money public code absolutely um but uh, it still was very surprising and then of course as you said it was then also surprising how successful it was at the end there were really a ton of people different teams participated and yeah you said it already that um one of the cool features of the latest uh of the last release from us next at hub three this org chart feature actually as was the result of this hackathon um, where some people got together and thought about, hmm, that's a cool idea. Why don't we, every organization has some kind of structure, people who are responsible for different areas. And this information is often somehow stored in the directory, like an LDAP or Active Directory. And yeah, this feature basically uh, reads the information from the directory and then graphically shows like an organizational chart of the, yeah, of the organization. And that's really super cool. That's a super cool, innovative feature. And that's the result of this hackathon. So um, yeah, really, really, really nice uh, experience, I have to say. Definitely. I was a bit more in involved during that, that process. I think we were running that uh, together with the European Commission for, I believe, the span of four weeks or something like that. Uh, and not not to go over, over all of the submissions, but uh, a particularly nice thing I've noticed was like uh, some of the teams, and I believe it was even the previously mentioned team that worked on the uh, org chart feature. Um, they were like done uh, ahead of time um, b before like some of the milestones, and then I started helping out other teams. So um, this, even though it was, I mean, obviously this was all about bringing people together and contribute to a common goal. But um, even with the, those in those settings, it was a bit of a competition since there was a prize involved. But uh, even that, that way, and and even with that in mind, they they helped out other teams, and um, that they also helped like onboard like like local teams or local hacker groups and and introduce them to Nextcloud and stuff. So we were still seeing effects and and positive outcomes from that. So this is awesome. I hope we can do this again at some point. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And it was, um, I was invited by the, by an, an, an event, uh, hosted by the European, uh, Commission, like a few, two, two months ago in Brussels. And also at this event, like people came to me and said, yeah, next one is great. And like, uh, we helped to, uh, to fund this hackathon. And because, um, uh, they thought it's a cool idea. And yeah, it, it was really, it's really so totally surprising. That um, that so many people in the, the European Commission are, are supporting us. Of course, it is like a bit. I mean, it's the message and our mission of Nextcloud that we are, um, yeah, supporting digital sovereignty to keep the data under control, GDPR compliance, uh, and so on. Working together with the Gaia X project, which is another European project, to have more cloud infrastructure in hosted in Europe. So it's course totally in line aligned with what we are doing but uh, as i said still surprising that um yeah we have so many f fans everywhere this uh, is going to be a good as the time as any to say that all of the topics that we're going to talk about today are also going to be linked below in the in the show notes um, for almost all the topics we have uh, fully written articles on our blog that we will link to so if you want to look in any of those topics uh, deeper then uh, feel free to look into the show notes um, another thing I want to mention is, um, of course, um, our awesome community. Um, so, um, because Nextcloud there is a company here, uh, which does a lot of things that uh, some people think that uh, the company does everything, um, but it's not not true. Uh, actually, we have like several thousand, uh, several th uh, thousands of contributors, um, like contributing to the core of Nextcloud alone. And this is not even uh, counting uh, app developers or translators or uh, other people who help to push Nextcloud forward. It's not just people who contribute to the core of Nextcloud alone. So Nextcloud is a really, really big community and everybody um, can be part of it. And that's something that's for me also very, very, very important. First, it's also part of our values that we are an open, welcoming, inclusive place where everybody can yeah, be part of 
Um, we are actually also um, actively investing <clears throat> to make this even easier. So um, just in the last few months, for example, we relaunched uh, our website, developer website, uh, where all the, the documentation is listed, the APIs and how to set up a development environment and how to upload your app to the app store we have and many other things that are needed to, to get started. And we also um, worked on um, producing some videos. So we have a bunch of videos actually now, how to, um, yeah, how to write your first app, how to set up your environment and everything. So if you prefer to watch a video instead of reading a text, then this is also um, exists now. And yeah, I think we really, really want to be a super welcoming place. And if you want to contribute something to Nextcloud, um, then have a look. It's um, it's easy. You don't have to directly start with writing super complicated things or features. Uh, we have a lot of uh, starter topics also on GitHub Marked, where really everybody can do something small to push uh, Nextcloud forward. So um, yeah, just an invitation for everybody to have a look and uh, join the Nextcloud community and. Um, yeah, also, of course, then uh, come to the next conference. Maybe you have, like, you can meet the people in person. There are more tutorials. You can directly ask people, how can we do this or that? Um, yeah, we are really nice, a nice group of people, I can say. And, uh, yeah, just consider to contribute. Absolutely. And we're going to link to all of those resources in the show notes. In May 2022, we released Nextcloud Hub 24 or uh, Nextcloud Hub 2, um, which has had its main focus on like user migration and improvements to Office and Chalk. Um, I don't think we're going to get too much into the all of the, the features, but I wanted to particularly highlight the migration feature we've introduced that allows you to basically export all of your settings data um, that you have on your next load wherever it's hosted if it's self hosted on a Raspberry Pi or somewhere at a, a next load partner and put it back in, in, in of what I did I was using next load all in one on a Raspberry Pi and later this uh, that year I decided to use that setting to migrate over to one of our partners since I couldn't host after I was moving boring networking details but um, I actually with that even that still gives you the chance that you can also go to way back uh, at some point since i now have resolved my network issue i'm gonna actually move that back inside and start self-hosting next lot again mm -hmm. so that was a particularly nice thing to see and um there were there were also a bunch of improvements that that made it easier to migrate from from other um solutions like uh, google drive and dropbox and stuff so yeah but what do you think about all of these migration features yeah, I'm actually happy that you, um, that you picked uh, that feature to talk about because that's is uh, like a very important one. Um, because we have to go back a little bit and Nextcloud, what we actually want to achieve to give people back the, the control over their data and their communication. And if, if you have a Raspberry Pi where everything is stored or some other <laughs> like uh, ho home device, uh, then everything is easy, right? You have to, your data there in, in your box, uh, in, in your closet or whatever that's that's good but not everybody really wants to run like a server at home so a lot of people actually use nextcloud at the service provider because we have lots of companies that offer nextcloud hosting but then of course the question is okay why exactly is this better than uh, like i don't know giving you data to microsoft or google um, and the answer is of course that um, because it is nextcloud is open source you can host it yourself. And as you just described perfectly, you can like host it at home, go to a service provider, host your company, university, your school, I don't know. And um, then also you have to, should have the freedom to move your data around between them. Because if you don't like one location anymore, you can move to a different one. And this is then the freedom that you get with Nextcloud. Because if you then, if you would be locked in, by a service provider and there's no way to get your data out and no way to move to a different service provider, then, well, it would be the, <laughs> the same negative experience than what you have with uh, Dropbox or Microsoft, Google and the others. So actually this feature to migrate your data from one Nextcloud server to another Nextcloud server is like super important to what we want to achieve. Um, that's like something we uh, worked on 
like for a while, actually, actually many, many years ago, I think there was the first attempt to implement that feature, but it uh, was, yeah, it was not how it should be. And then a few years later, we basically um, did it again and now in the right way. And that's the feature we released with this version. So you can, yeah, you can migrate your, um, your data and move it to another instance as you, as you want. But I think also <laughs> to be a little bit honest here, not only just share marketing messages, this feature also has a bit of a problem. Also want to point this out because if you have data that is shared with other people, um, then do you, the migration might not be that easy. Right. Let's say you have a shared folder with other people. You have a chat channel, uh, a shared chat channel with other people. You have a shared calendar with other people. Then if you then export your data and move to a different server, then, then this is obviously this connection is lost. So that's a bit of something that you need to realize. We have for some areas, um, we have federation features, like you can have federated sharing between different servers. And then a later version, maybe we can, convert like internal shares to federated shares and maybe the future uh, local uh, talk chat rooms to federated chat rooms but that's not that's not done yet so at the moment you might lose like uh, the connection to other people when you move away and other people stay at other instance We've also seen lots of movements in the EU around Microsoft 365 uh, in terms of GDPR compliance and many European countries and uh, companies and schools and in the educational sector um, saying that you actually shouldn't be shouldn't use Microsoft 365 because it's not compliant with GDPR. This isn't as surprising to us as it was presented back then because we kind of knew this from the beginning and that's, that's kind of also what Nextdoor stands for because some of the stuff that we offer there, these, these bigger, um, cloud providers just don't offer. Um, but we haven't particularly seen many countries following this advice. Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh gosh, that's a, that's a huge topic. I yeah. can talk about it for hours. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there are obviously many, many, many problems with the, uh, with the, the business practices of Microsoft here. I mean, um, well, we just discussed like the, the login, the vendor login. Um, and this is of course like super bad and super strong here with Microsoft. There's basically absolutely no way if you don't like Microsoft anymore to ever move away from it because, um, well, there's no APIs to export your data. I mean, you can export your files, obviously, but if you want to export your, I don't know, your Teams or SharePoint or other complicated data, there's no real way to do that. And even if you could, then there is no other software where you can import it. And, um, of course, there's no way to take the Microsoft uh, software and run it like on-premise and your, for example, your Raspberry Pi, as you just described. So you, this is where you have your, the complete lock, lock in. So basically, whenever you start to use Microsoft, then you're done. You're, there's nothing you can do. You will stick there forever or you lose everything. That's the alternative. So there are lots of problems there. And also another big problem is obviously the, the GDPR compliance that is uh, not there um, because of the Cloud Act in the US. It means that um, uh, US-based uh, law enforcement and other agencies are have full access to the data, even if it's hosted in a hosting center in Europe or outside the US. Um, and you have a contract with the, I don't know, the local European subsidiary of Microsoft, and you think that, well, then this is obviously um, following European laws, but because of Cloud Act, it's actually not. So um, this whole thing is not GDPR compliant as, as was decided by the highest European court that this is a GDPR violation. So that's another problem. And many, many other things, business practices, like, for example, giving away free accounts to schools during the pandemic. And now... Um, they are getting all the invoices now because now it's no longer free, but they have no way to move around, move away because they cannot get the data out. So there are lots and lots and lots of problems with Microsoft um, proprietary software. You cannot really look inside. You don't know who ex has access to the data. You cannot really innovate on top of it because again, it's you no know, one is uh, allowed to see uh, the software. Many many problems, and I'm actually happy to see that um, 
that more and more organizations and institutions all over Europe are um, recognizing that and warning, uh, giving out warnings um, against uh, the usage of Microsoft products. So I'm slightly optimistic that uh, more and more people realize that. And of course, there's like more and didn't even didn't even mention so far the whole bundling and antitrust topic. We'll get to that. Yeah, let's get to that later. That's another thing. As I said, I can talk about it for hours. So Microsoft is really, that's really not good. It's really, it's like, I don't know, if you could, if you, if you compare this to food, then, um, it basically, it's basically, uh, fast food, right? It's like uh, something that is like nice and convenient and cheap at the beginning, but it really makes people sick and not healthy anymore. And I don't know if you want to have a proper food industry <laughs> and proper uh, food that we can uh, consume, then uh, I think you also want to have a proper IT world. And I think uh, you don't want to have uh, Microsoft or Google in there. You want to have proper open source tools that's just healthier. And there are reasons to be optimistic. Um, I mean, uh, f the French Ministry of Education uh, recently just banned uh, all the free versions of Microsoft 365 and Google Workspace in schools. Um, Denmark um, even went so far as to, for one school district, to recall and ban all Google Chromebooks. And um, even their, their government data protection agency uh, advises against that use. And also two states in Germany um, made, made similar rulings. Um, and I think what we're hoping for, especially in this year is that we start seeing actions around that instead of recommendations. Related to that actually is an initiative that I believe not started in 2022, but I think late 2021, but uh, has gained some more traction in the last year was our antitrust complaint about Microsoft business practices. Can you maybe give a bit of a recap what has happened there and what the most recent update there is? This specific topic is about uh, bundling practices. Um, maybe I have to, um, <laughs> to explain a little bit what this means. Uh, I also learned more about uh, antitrust laws and product bundling uh, lately more than I wanted to learn, but that's, uh, that's how it is. Yeah. Um, so um, there's actually in, in most countries, or yeah, all major countries all over the world, there are antitrust uh, uh, laws. Antitrust laws mean that if a if an if an, an organization or com a company uh, is, is gaining so much uh, like market share influence market dominance that they're basically yeah that a monopolist in some area this by itself is not yet the problem and yeah, I personally think it is a problem but not from the law perspective not from legal perspective this is fine right people can be dominant but what they're not allowed to do is to use this dominant position to then uh, like increase the dominance in other areas, basically. I mean, it's like, um, can I come up with an example is Microsoft Office? <laughs> yeah, I just want to use a different example, but yeah, let's directly, of course, jump to Microsoft. I think the example is clear enough. I mean, one thing you can always say is like the browser wars of the 90s. I mean, some of the listeners are probably too young to remember that, but maybe you can summarize it a bit. Um, Microsoft already with Windows was the dominant um, operating system at the time. So most people really used uh, uh, Microsoft on their computers, Microsoft Windows. Um, and then this new uh, this new invention came around called the Internet. And then uh, everybody needed a browser. And there were actually some different organizations offering a browser. Some like uh, as free and open source as uh, Mosaic browser, but later the Netscape, they tried to build a business around that. Um, and they were successful for a while, but then uh, Microsoft decided like, hey, let's just include a free browser in our operating system and they bundled Intel Explorer. And then basically Netscape was dead because they couldn't charge any money anymore because the other thing was giving away for free. And this was basically an example where they're, Microsoft used their dominant uh, position in with Windows to just like got become the dominant browser in the world because then everybody's using Internet Explorer not because it's good it was always bad but because it was there it was just pre-installed everywhere um, and then um, yeah there were some antitrust uh, complaints and uh, lawsuits against that and 
and at the end, um, yeah, Microsoft lost, or there was some sort of compromise, um, and they needed to implement this browser selection screen. So if you then click on the uh, the browser, you first ask, hey, do you want to use this browser or that browser, like, I don't know, Firefox or Mozilla or uh, Opera or all these browsers that exist at the time? Um, and this was then basically the, the outcome. And uh, yeah, it's actually super surprising that Microsoft um, even they lost this at the case. They're just doing it again. They just ignore it, and they're like, "Okay, we're just violating the law, but who cares? Just do it again." And nowadays, if you um, install or if you run uh, Windows 10 or Windows 11 for the first time, it immediately gets like pop-ups like, "Hey, and here's your new OneDrive account, and your client is pre-installed." and I think if you run Windows 11 Pro, then um, it's mandatory to get a Microsoft account, um, and then you're automatically already logged in. Basically, if you just log into your desktop, you're already logged into uh, into OneDrive and Teams. Teams is of course also in your taskbar, and you're just with one click, you're automatically in there. So this is also why Teams and OneDrive like got a huge market share, not because the software is good, it's actually bad. But yeah, it's just pre-installed, and they're getting um, one market from one market into the next. And uh, this is not this is not uh, correct. This is not good. This is hurting business, hurting innovation, hurting privacy. And um, this is why we send in an official complaint uh, about this business practice um, to the European Commission, but also to the German authorities. And um, yeah, we are actually um, in uh, still in conversations. Uh, I cannot say too much, but I have a, not a meeting in Brussels in just a few days to discuss that. So let's see how it how it goes. It's definitely taken seriously by the European Commission. Um, and the other thing that happened is that we are um, not doing this alone, but we have a coalition where uh, a lot of other organizations who support us uh, basically, um, yeah, together are basically uh, supporting this uh, this good cause and like are complaining uh, against Microsoft so it's a bigger a bigger group and um, yeah I personally was blown away by the overall interest in that so we got like covered by all major newspapers like hundreds all over the world actually and um, yeah so a lot of people care about that um, and now it's the discussions are ongoing. I cannot say too much, but uh, yeah, I hope that there will be some interesting movements and announcements soon. One thing we can briefly touch on since it has been reported about is didn't they at some point try to offer incentives for you to change your mind about that complaint and to maybe withdraw the name next lot of that? Uh, what happened there? Yeah, this was interesting um, because when this happened, and all the press wrote about it. Then uh, I thought, suddenly got a lot of contact requests from uh, Microsoft people who wanted to talk, and I just um, yeah ignored them because there's nothing to talk. What should I talk about? Um, but at some point, I really was because of a personal recommendation. Actually, talked with some uh, with some people in, uh, in in Seattle and Redmond, uh, the headquarters, um, and then the, the conversation there first. They first tried the usual marketing trick where they're like, hey, Microsoft is nice now. We are so nice. We are releasing uh, Visual Studio Code. Um, it's so cool. And we also have uh, GitHub. And it's so nice. And we're also contributing some drivers to the Linux kernel. So we're such a nice company now, which um, <laughs> it's like not completely true. They realized that they're not, not falling for that. Um, and then uh, that started to discuss like yeah maybe there's uh, some kind of deal something we can do maybe some donations or some free promotion or some some logo on some website or something but then they realized that this is also not working um, and after that they started to contact other companies and organizations in our coalition and offered them favors like hey we can sponsor the next conference we can I don't know, offer you some, something, um, if you, if they basically leave our, our, our coalition. And that's, um, I was really shocked by that. Uh, I have to say, uh, they're, they're really trying to solve it with money now, which I think 
it's not going to work. I think they gave up by now. But what's happening now is, of course, tons of lobbying with politics. Um, I say, yeah, it's just needed and there's no real alternative to Microsoft. So if you don't really want Microsoft, then you're falling behind with digitalization um, and so on, which was not true. But yeah, very interesting to <laughs> have these kind of conversations. We've also introduced in 2022 an advisory board um, regarding Nextcloud Office, um, where we started talking to, to more companies and what their needs and requirements are. Can you maybe elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, definitely. Um, I actually get this question surprisingly often, um, what this is, <laughs> this uh, advisory board and so on. So the, the background is the following, that um, we as Nextcloud, as discussed before, we of course have the vision to um, provide an alternative to Microsoft and Google products, especially Microsoft. Um, and um, we, of course, we do that. There are a lot of areas where this is also relatively straightforward. I mean, the whole syncing part of Nextcloud files, it's pretty clear how it should work. Chat, video calling, this is all relatively straightforward. But the thing is that if you really want to replace Microsoft products in an organization, and it can be public administration, by the way, this was sort of the focus here, but it's the same for uh, for companies, then um, you're also dealing with uh, existing uh, documents that are floating around in the organization. And they're usually, uh, most of the time, done with Microsoft Office. So we have Word, Excel, PowerPoint files, and so on. This is like really, this is, there are millions of, uh, billions, <laughs> probably files like that floating around in these organizations. And they are, were all created and done uh, over the last 20 years. And um, if you really want to replace uh, Microsoft with Nextcloud, then it is absolutely uh, important, essential, that all these documents, that just work flawlessly uh, with Nextcloud. Uh, because if someone opens a document and just, I don't know, the, the spreadsheet calculates wrongly or just the layout is broken, then, um, yeah, people will not be happy. Um, and this is why this whole document compatibility and just have all the functionality around uh, Office is like super important. Um, and, um, yeah, there are also some documents that are crazy complicated. For example, some of you might know that. In Microsoft Office documents, you can really do a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, you can have like embedded macros, OLE uh, objects, um, like Visual Basic script. You can call external things. It's really, it's really quite. Uh, yeah, you could call it powerful. You can also call it, uh, yeah, nuts, crazy. Um, and all of that just has to work somehow. And, um, yeah, of course, we are working together with our main partner, with this uh, Collabora, Collabora Online. Um, they are also major contributors to LibreOffice. Um, so there's a ton of experience here that exists with uh, import filters and proper document rendering. But still, we really want to talk with the actual users um, of uh, Nextcloud Office. So we created this advisory board where we invited like yeah, the IT experts from all these different organizations. Um, at the moment, we have people from the Swedish government, uh, German government, French government now, um, Switzerland too, and um, yeah, also inviting and talking with other people. And uh, yeah, they come together. We meet from uh, from time to time in person, but also have regular calls. And that just tell us what's important, like what is not working, what should be better, what's priority for them. And so we know what we need to improve and need to need to fix in what order. So that's basically just input from the <laughs> let's say uh, office power users out there. I believe one of those features that came out of those talks was the custom or the option to upload custom and or proprietary fonts for Nextcloud Office, yeah. which um, brings us to the next topic, which would be Nextcloud Hub 3, our most recent release uh, that we announced during Nextcloud Conference. But I would like to start with, with Nextcloud Hub 3. 
from looking back at, at at least five years of our most recent releases, this was easily one of the most features uh, that we put out. It was also very well received as such. Uh, we put so many things in, uh, the highlights only being like our brand new design, Nextcloud Personal. Um, we got photos to the O um, with a built-in editor. We got a bunch of AI in there now for face recognition um, that runs locally on your Nextcloud, so you don't even have to use uh, big and uh, bad proprietary providers for that so uh, th there are so many things there frank can, can you pick a highlight of any of those things from from hub free do you remember <laughs> no I, i think it wouldn't be fair to pick a highlight um True. because as you said there are so many different things i mean it's i mean it's really from the design you you started with that um the design is really we did a, a fresh up um it's it's more colorful now looks more modern, just more personal. So that's why it's called it Nextcloud Personal, um, which is, I think, really nice. Um, it's also one of the very few redesigns where I think, I, I don't know if I saw a single negative comment about it. It seems to be liked by everybody from our internal developers to our community customers, everybody. So that's quite a nice thing. Um, then um, a lot of things that use, uh, is, is um, useful for like home users is the photos app um we had a photos app before but it was really lacking um, important features and now we basically with one uh, with one release invested so much time into it that it is really really yeah, powerful and yeah, basically feature complete now it's really from a faster performance with a nice grid view um, with this album view where you can um, organize the photos in different albums. They can be in different albums. This can also be shared albums. Also with a public link where people can only upload or only look, uh, view or something in between. <laughs> And then we have the editor where you can edit like your photos very nicely in the browser. Um, and then we have the new machine learning features where you can do face recognition, object recognition and so on. So this is really super, super useful now. Um, then of course we have lots of those more enterprisey features, like, I don't know, that this org chart feature we already mentioned in the contacts app or just like, yeah, performance and usability improvement in mail, um, calendar, lots of improvements in Nextcloud talk. We have this, um, Uh, permission system, which really a lot more detailed where if you're running like, uh, like a school or university and you really want to moderate who can talk, who can present the screen and so on. Um, there's a polls feature, super popular. You can do polls directly in the chat. Um, we have the new widgets where you have this nice widget previews for different, um, links and assets you can post into a chat channel. Um, also super, super popular. Um, Yeah, lots of improvement in Nextcloud text and collectives and then in Office, as we already mentioned. Um, we also have this feature with the local editing. So you can really smoothly um, edit some documents in the browser or with one click switch to the local editor. Like if you have a local LibreOffice you want to use or Photoshop or some other proprietary software because you need to work with the proprietary uh, format. And you couldn't do that. And with another click, just switch back into the browser. Um, so there are really so many different things. Um, I think it's a very nice release. But I have to say um, <laughs> that, that because we're not stopping, uh, we're already into deep development of the next release. And so far, I have to say, it looks, I don't know if it has to say it's the same size, but it will be another huge step forward. So we are not, uh, we're not stopping here. Absolutely. And that's definitely going to become a topic for a later episode. <laughs> yeah, for Hub3, it, it was really hard to pick favorites and uh, kind of unfair to ask for. But if, if I would have to choose one, um, I would also say the Nextcloud Personal, our brand new design that was also like for, from the ground up built um, to to work better with screen readers and so many more accessibility features that were built in and, and different um The different light and dark modes and the font for people with dyslexia and, and all of those good, all of those good things. So from a usability point of view, um, I think I would pick next up personal, the design. Should we, should we pivot over to the conference, which is, um, where we presented this release? Oh, yes. In, I believe, end of September, I believe, first of October, I believe it was. 
we run after two years of virtual conferences uh, or no conference at all. Our first in-person conference again, our next conference event that we did in Berlin, where we invited hundreds of contributors, uh, customers, people interested in open source. And we had like a huge lineup of speakers um, from all over the world around those topics, not only tied to Nextcloud, but also to open source accessibility. Um, how can we keep making our products better, be the better solution against proprietary? solutions so that there, there were so many things uh, and i'm gonna ask the unfair question again frank do you have any highlights to pick from those <laughs> yeah i mean for me it's if i think back about the history how this all started that's the most amazing thing from my perspective because as you might know when i when i, when I started with that um with Nextcloud at the time, still under a different name, but still same people, same ideas, same software. Then, um, yeah, at the beginning was only me, but then uh, quickly we had some people who were contributing code. And then at some point I, I messaged them and said, hey, why don't you come over here at uh, Stuttgart? I had a small office at the time. And I, hey, we just like meet for a weekend and just we talk and hack a bit. And then, uh, yeah, five people showed up. And then we had this basically, um, <laughs> first conference. Uh, it was just like six people, including me. Um, and, uh, yeah, we just improved things a lot and hacked together for, um, for a weekend. And then it was so much fun that we decided that we want to do this again. Um, and next time I think 10 people showed up and then 15 people. And then at some point it was like, okay, we need a bigger location. And then we had like already the uh, Technical University um, of Berlin as an early uh, user. And they said, yeah, no problem. We can host you. And then we actually went, um, uh, did a conference or the meeting in their location, like for many years. And then it just was growing to whatever, 30 people, 50 people, 100 people and so on. And then of course, with so many people, it's not just like, few people come together and hack on things, but then you're, yeah, let's have a talk and have like a real program and have a social event or a party in the evening and have some food there and music and uh, all the things and a program and a website and registration forms and <laughs> really all the stuff. And then really turned into a, into a real, real conference. Um, then we had the problem that a uh, problem, not really problem, but that, um, Lots of different people showed up. For example, also business people. But I said, like, yeah, they just came there and said, hey, we want to use it in our company. And then well, all the people sitting there in black t-shirts are hacking on code. And like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you want. I'm writing code here. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, we had to organize that. And then uh, nowadays we have like actually parallel events for the business users where they can do their business talks and then the other event, the real conference where it's really about hacking and contributing and having fun. And uh, yeah, and this yeah kept on growing and I don't have the latest number how many people we had like last year, but like I don't know, two hundred, two hundred fifty, something like that. Maybe even more. I, I believe idea. a bit more, but I also don't have the exact number on top of my head. Yeah, but it was really, really big. It was a yeah, it's a really big, nice conference. And of course, nowadays we um, move to a, a better, nicer location. We have a real yeah, event space there with hacking areas and food and a big room for the uh, talks and live video streaming. Thanks to you, Marius. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so really, really nice event. It's really, um, yeah, mind blowing. Yes, yeah, speaking of those videos and the live streams, I will actually link to the playlist of all of the talks, lightning talks and panel sessions and everything we did there that um, resulted in video content. Uh, I'll link to that playlist on YouTube, uh, click on it in the show notes. Obviously, there were so many things happening in parallel, not not only the talks of the hack sessions, we had workshops and everything there and community people coming together and to work on more projects or actually people meeting for the first time in person that have been contributing to the next lot um, in, in small teams in uh for for years now so that that was really a good event to bring people together and we had so many which is why i'm linking to those videos so many great talks about topics not only about next Cloud, but also about the larger open source ecosystem and uh, yeah, i can only recommend giving that those a watch 
all of our efforts are in and around Nextcloud haven't gone unnoticed. Once again, we've won the cloud computing inside our boards, um, I believe for the fourth or fifth year in a row, something like that. Do you remember that? Um, we participated like for five years or six years, but the first prize we actually won like the third year in a row. Ah. Could you describe why that award might be more important than maybe others or what, what the metrics were? How, how was that decided of who would grant, who would get granted that award? Yeah. So I'm in general not such a big fan of awards, I have to say, and there are lots and lots of awards and, I don't know. It's not really clear who wins, why. And there are even some awards that you can pay to win. So I am overall not a big fan of awards. But this award is, I think, a bit like interesting. Um, because first of all, it's not decided by a jury, but it's actually by voting of, uh, yeah, everybody can go to the website, register and vote. Um, so it's sort of, um, yeah, coming from the community. And also it is, um, the people who go to this website are usually like IT people. So this is, these are basically IP, IT people all over lots of different areas. I don't know, from server hardware to operating systems, storage systems. I don't know, lots of different categories. Um, and of course you vote also for other categories usually. So, um, yeah, and we won the first prize, um, like for the third year in a row. So this means that, um, yeah, people who reach this website, I mean, it's mostly German speaking, um, to be fair, but still, um, in this, in this bubble, we are like the most popular solution in this whole, um, cloud, um, collaboration space. And, um, th in the third, uh, the third place actually was won by Dropbox. So we are first one, uh, Dropbox far behind us, and even further behind us is Google and Microsoft. So um, that's really, um, yeah, <laughs> really nice. I think that the majority of uh, IT people uh, like here in Central Europe think that Nextcloud is so much better than all these commercial competitors. This, uh, yeah, made me uh, made me happy, a bit proud about the. Uh, what the next community to get uh, achieved. And obviously we couldn't do a recap of 2022 without talking about Twitter at this point. We saw at the end of 2022 Twitter being acquired by Elon Musk and him taking the company private and him making a bunch of, uh, I think it's fair to say, questionable decisions about uh, the, the products and its features and also about terms of content moderation and policies. Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> How many hours do we have? Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't think we need to uh, repeat um, everything that happened. I'm, I'm sure our listeners to this podcast are um, up to date what's uh, what's happening in Twitter. And at the end, I don't want to talk too much about the actual all terrible things, terrible decisions uh, by, by Elon Musk. Um, we all know that but i think what's more interesting to talk about is that the, what this actually shows what problems of the tech industry are actually visible here and what we all should do or can do maybe yeah yeah what we all can do to hopefully uh, avoid that in the future so um i mean the problem here is obviously that um one person is in complete control of this uh, social media platform. So it's an extreme power concentration uh, on, on one person. And it's not only like the the company itself. Of course, tons of employees were fired and the ones were still there, I'm sure, like uh, suffering a little bit under the current new management. So, of course, they're... Yeah, it's not good for them, but of course, in the case of a social media platform like Twitter, um, all the users uh, also have a problem here. And Twitter is such an important tool for yeah, political discussions, for influencing um, elections, many other things. And if just one person is in full control of that, that's really, really a big problem. And I think this is also why we are 
talking about Twitter all the time anyways, because otherwise, yeah, it's just another, another online service, another cloud platform, which goes down. Who cares? But it is really so influential. Um, I mean, I don't know. We just saw the, the latest uh, things that happened in Brazil with riots. And, uh, of course, uh, a few days before, Elon Musk fired all the content uh, moderation people in, from Brazil who could actually, yeah, moderate uh, some fake news. So this is like super, super dangerous. And, um, yeah, there are other companies. I mean, we know that Facebook, for example, which also then includes WhatsApp and uh, Instagram are also basically controlled by Mark Zuckerberg alone because he has the majority of the voting rights. So um, that's a problem. And with other tech companies, um, Google, Microsoft, and so on, this power concentration is a real problem. And um, I think what we can learn from that is that we as technology people should really think what we can do from a yeah, architecture, software perspective to avoid that. And, and one obvious answer is, of course, I mean, no one here is surprised, I guess, that uh, decentralization is something that's really important. Um, and um, it really makes me very, very happy to see how popular uh, Mastodon nowadays get with an approach which is, of course, a lot better. So the code is 100% open source for Mastodon. Everybody can uh, look into it, can see how it works. There are no secret, I don't know, ranking rules in there that not everybody knows. That's completely transparent. Everybody sees it. Um, of course, you can uh, host it um, yourself, um, decentralized. Again, very similar to Nextcloud. Again, Nextcloud is also open source. You can also host it yourself. You can also federate it. So very similar values. Uh, between Mastodon and Nextcloud. Um, of course, Nextcloud is mostly for yeah, collaboration, communication, and uh, Mastodon is a social network. But the overall idea is that such key technology should be open source and decentralized and not controlled by a single person. That's like very similar. And that this is working, um, or it's working so far for Mastodon, I think is uh, very, very promising. Because a lot of people will look at that and think, uh, hmm, this is also how an internet platform can run. Uh, we don't have an advertising business and we don't have gigantic venture capital shareholders and I don't know other things. We just have a bunch of technology people who write nice code and then suddenly have something that's useful for millions of users. So that's, that's really good. Another important thing to learn here is, of course, open standards. Um, because a lot of people think that, um, yeah, Mastodon, it's, it's just Mastodon, but it's actually, uh, the correct term is like the Fediverse here. Um, because you don't really have to use Mastodon to be part of it. The only thing that you need to do is to use some software that speaks the same language, the same API, the same standard activity pub in this case. And, um, yeah, there are lots of other, um, like software products around like video, for example, or, um, yeah, lots of different social media tools um, speaking the same language and we can all connect to that. Nextcloud is also participating there. We have something called Nextcloud Social, which is, um, also an implementation of activity pub. So we also have then the opportunity to post like messages into the Fediverse or receive messages there. Um, if you want to share your. I don't know, your vacation photo album. Um, you can do this then with one click. Um, and uh, I think this is something that more and more software should do. Just connect to this network, um, all speaking the same API. That's, from my perspective, the, the future. And personally, I'm also a bit happy um, because I was actually uh, a member of the W3C um, social working group, um, at a time when activity pub was, uh, was created. So, um, I wouldn't say that I really actively influenced it. Uh, I was, uh, there were other people driving it, but I, I was in the room. So I'm happy to, happy that I was in the room, uh, and uh, talked with the important people and witnessed basically the creation of activity pub. 
Um, and uh, yeah, it makes me very happy to see this um, becoming so successful now. Something to learn from uh, the Elon Musk chaos. Definitely. Can you outline our idea about Nextcloud Social a bit more? What we're what we're planning to do there? Because you already touched on that we we're working on a, a new iteration of of this feature of this app. How could that work? What could we expect? What are we working on right now? Yeah. yeah. So um, when we uh, did the first version of Nextcloud Social a while a while ago, some people criticized us. Um, hey, why do you want to have this in Nextcloud? Uh, do you want to become a social network? Um, just to be clear, <laughs> we are not becoming a social network. Nextcloud has a completely different mission and vision. And also there's also no need to invent another social network because that's exactly what Mastodon is doing. But uh, what is the cool thing, as I just tried to say, with an open standard is that you can implement it everywhere and then everybody can um, participate. So um, there are some things in Nextcloud that have that has a bit of a social networking character. For example, if you, if you're in your organization, let's say Nextcloud is used for in a school or university or company or your soccer club or I don't know something, then, um, you can, of course, share files, photos, chat with people, have video calls and so on. But there's also maybe the need that you can share like, um, yeah, status messages and say, Hey, I'm going for lunch now. And, um, I don't know, here's like, I don't know, the cool movie I saw on the weekend or something. So this is not really becoming a full social network. It's more like for like an internal social network, uh, basically. There's even a term for that. Um, there's something called enterprise social networks, which is exactly that, like internal social networks, basically. And that's something that, I mean, there's a solution from Microsoft, uh, Google and others. And of course, we also want to do something there, but we want to do it like in a, in a good way. Um, again, using this standard. Um, for even for the internal stuff. And then, of course, there is then the idea that you can connect it with the rest of the Fediverse. Um, because maybe there are messages that you also want to share to other people outside your organization, or you want to show status messages from certain people that from the outside also going in, or for the sharing part, as I said, if you want to share your, I don't know, vacation video or photo album or whatever with your social network, then this kind of integration can be cool that this sharing is possible with one click. So there is a bit of a, there is a bit of a opportunity here, like a tiny bit of an overlap between Nextcloud and social network like Mastodon. Um, if it, you can compare it with email too, right? It's like right. there are full email services. I don't know. Uh, Gmail or something like that, where I can have a full email inbox, folders, reading mails, sending mails, everything you want. But email is also supported in other software. I don't know, for example, your router can send you an email if there's a new software update available or something like that. So it also implements SMTP uh, to send mails or your, I don't know, your your, your fridge sending you a mail if you, if the milk goes, goes bad. I don't know if this is a thing, but theoretically. <laughs> so yeah, and you all participate in this network called SMTP or mail. And the same thing can happen with activity pub. And that's what we try to do. We should probably also stress the fact that since this was semi prompted by the happenings over at Twitter, um, if you are already participating in the Fediverse and you're on a specific method and instance and you disagree with some of the choices that that instance makes or you want to switch to a self hosted solution or maybe to an Xload social, there is that, that migration path and that interoperability there, which also aligns with all values at Nextcloud. So that's, yeah, that, that is exactly meant to, to prevent, um, such things as we're seeing right now unfolding at Twitter. Exactly. Yeah. All right. That pretty much brings us to the end of our 2022 recap. Maybe we, we try to give a bit of an outlook of what's going to happen to Nextcloud and in and around Nextcloud in 2023. Frank, can you can you tease any of uh, anything that that we can might expect in in the next releases or the following year? What do you think? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid of that. No, 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 no. no, no I'm kidding. So, um, it's. 
I'm saying no because we usually have the, the policy or the, the rule that we don't really want to pre-announce things. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know. This is maybe a personal thing for me, but I hate it when people pre-announce things and then um, you get excited and then maybe that never happened or they're right. are super delayed or they're like, it works out differently than what you expect. And I don't know, you have all this hype and there's nothing there. So I don't really like this pre-announcement. So in next life, we usually talk about things once they're available. Um, I, I think it's just nicer somehow. But um, yeah, but maybe there are some things I can say because they're so advanced in the development that it's basically sort of confirmed um, what's going to happen. That would be great. So let me think. What can I say? I mean, there's one thing that um, <laughs> there's one thing that I think is, I don't know if it's the number one feature request in next lot talk or the number two or I don't know one, one of the one of the absolutely top feature requests we get like all the time is um, that um, it would be great to have some sort of a desktop client right for talk. Because as you know, we have obviously the web UI, the, the website. Then we have our mobile apps for iOS and Android. Um, we also have it integrated into the Nextcloud desktop client. So you get then nice notifications and you can directly reply to messages in the desktop client. But st people still, um, are asking for like a full, yeah, full desktop client, a full application that you can run for chatting and video calling locally for Mac, Windows, Linux. And, um, yeah, I mean, we worked on that for a really, really long time. Um, and, but I think now I can say that uh, this is most likely going to happen because we are so, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so far that, um, a lot of big questions are solved. Um, so maybe I can tease that at some point. I'm not saying that this is really for the next week, by the way. Um, but um, I think I can tease a little bit that there will be a talk desktop client. Um, it's making good progress. Yeah, just today as we're recording this, I uh, was fortunate enough to see like an internal demo of that. And I'm really looking forward to what's going to come out of that. But yeah, maybe not for the next release, but... Um... It it is in the cards for 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 future release. Something will happen. All right, that brings us to the end of this uh, 2022 recap. And um, Frank, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time. Thanks a lot for having me. And I will talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye bye. And there we have it, our first episode of 2023. Thank you very much again to Frank for taking the time. And please let us know what your highlights of Nextload were in 2022 or what feature we've introduced that you particularly liked. And make sure to leave us your feedback and suggestions for the podcast. We will be back in February with another episode. And in the meantime, I would like to point you to our blog and our social media channels to keep up to date with what's happening in and around Nextload. Thank you very much for listening and we'll be back soon.